What's up, everybody? You can be seated. Happy Easter, everybody. Got a nice little kiss there to start my message. Ready to go now. And I'm so happy you're here. My name is Brad, and I'm so happy you're here, especially this Easter. It just feels to me like the events of Easter have never been more relevant than they are right now. Because Easter speaks to our deepest fears. And I can't remember a time, at least in my lifetime, where it seems like more people are afraid of more things than right now. And I don't know what will go on your list of fears, but I think we're wondering what's going on in the world and where's it all headed. And we're, you know, fearing and looking at, you know, the last few years. Uh, we have had to confront the, the uh, reality of our mortality with wars on the other side of the earth, crowded hospitals right here at home, and it's just really honest and really human to wonder what's on the other side of this life. We worry about the economy, and man, am I going to be able to afford to put gas in my car? Am I going to be able to afford health insurance in a few years? And we worry about our health. Am I going to uh, get sick? Is somebody that I love going to get sick? And with all of these fears swirling around, it feels at times like fear is just in the air that we're breathing. I'm so grateful for Easter because Easter is not the story of a group of superhuman believers that faced an extraordinary crisis with mountain moving faith. It's not the story of Easter. Easter is the story of some disillusioned, heartbroken disciples who watched their Savior die watched their faith crumbling right before their eyes and then huddled up together in fear. <laughs> and so I want to take you just to a fresh, hopefully, st telling of the story of Easter because you know, one of the challenges today, if you've ever been to an Easter service before, is that you know the story. And we haven't had to process the death of Jesus without the coinciding knowledge of his resurrection. And so at times I think that, you know, we kind of have this idea in our heads that when Jesus died on the cross, the disciples were just like, hey, it's okay. It's okay. We knew this was coming. And so, you know, start the countdown clock. Start the timer. Sunday's on the way. I've had, at least in my head at times, this image that the disciples were like camping out in tents outside the tomb on Saturday night, you know, like, uh, like they were outside in a line at the Apple store waiting for a new iPhone to get released. And Peter was on the mic and they had the band going on Easter Sunday morning and he just started counting down backwards from 10. You know, 10 is going to be Lazarus all over again. Nine, his body's about to shine. Eight, let's get ready to celebrate. Seven, he's taking us all to heaven. Six, somebody turn up the dance mix. Five, he's almost alive. No. There was no bad rhyming, no DJ, no dance party going on outside of the tomb. Instead, what you had was a group of disheartened men and women wondering if they'd wasted the last few years of their lives. There was nobody when Jesus died on the cross who believed that he was the savior of the world or the son of God. When Jesus died, there were no Christians because there was no Christ. There was no Jesus followers because there was no Jesus. And so when Jesus died on the cross, listen, there was nobody planning the next move. How are we going to keep the dream alive? Because according to all indications, Jesus was not the person he had claimed to be. I just want you to see how little expectation there was from the disciples that anything good was going to happen out of the death of Jesus. Let's pick it up in Mark chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. The reason they wanted to anoint his body was because they were expecting Jesus was going to do exactly what dead people do, and that's stay dead. So they were in the grieving process. They were saying goodbye. It says in uh, verse 2, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. But they were not expecting that the stone was going to be rolled away. 
Verse 5, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And look at their disposition. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now, go and tell his disciples, including Peter, because he's going to need a little extra help, that Jesus is going, ahead of, is going ahead of you to Galilee. Now, this is where you'd think, you know, they're going to go tell the disciples, and everybody's going to be like, awesome. He was right. Let's, let's, let's figure out what we're going to do next. It's not what happened. Look at verse 10. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. One translation says they thought it was nonsense, which is how you know the disciples weren't married. Because you know, guys, that you never tell a woman that what she's saying is nonsense. That would be nonsense. In fact, uh, I read recently that uh, women spend more time wondering what men are thinking about than men actually spend thinking. So... <laughs> Some groundbreaking research for you there. But you may be in the place that the disciples were in and saying, you know, Brad, I might be able to get behind Jesus as a good teacher and an inspiring historical figure, but the idea that he literally and physically rose from the dead, I mean, I can't get there. That just, that just sounds like nonsense. That's where Jesus' disciples were. That's how Jesus' own mother was feeling. In fact, I want to just take you to Luke chapter 24 where we continue the story because everything now is going to change that Sunday night. Verse 36. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. Why did he say peace be with you? Because, I don't know about you, if I watched someone die... And a few days later, they're standing in my living room. I need some peace and a change of pants. Probably is what I'm going to need in that moment. I mean, they're freaking out. Verse 37. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? I just want you to see, this was not a group of true believers. They thought it was likelier that Jesus' ghost was visiting them in their home than that Jesus had rose from the dead. And that's when Jesus begins to explain to them what was happening and said some words that have changed the world forever. Verse 46. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. Jesus said what's starting here in Jerusalem is not going to stay here. It's going to the nations. It's even going to be in Philadelphia 2,000 years later in 2022. It's still going to be changing lives, still going to be transforming lives. Why? Because Jesus said, you and you and all of you heartbroken disciples, and my disappointed mom, and oh yeah, my cynical, skeptical brother sitting over there in the corner, all of you are going to become eyewitnesses to the fact that I was killed, that I was buried, and that I rose from the dead. In other words, Jesus said, you are going to present to the world some evidence. I uh, uh, was thinking about Lee Strobel, who has a fascinating story. Lee Strobel was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He was an award-winning journalist. And he was also a lifelong committed atheist. He, like the disciples at the time, thought this was all nonsense. And his wife became a Christian. And when his wife became a Christian, he was so upset, it was rocking his world, he set out to disprove Christianity so he could get her out of the cult that he thought she was in. So he started combing through the evidence just like a journalist would do. He didn't give the Bible any kind of special credibility as a book that was inspired by God. He just began to bring the same standards to the ancient documents that any historian would bring to any historical documents. 
And what happened is that not only, did, not only did he not find evidence to get his wife out of Christianity, he became converted because of the evidence he found. He became convinced that Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead and changed everything for him. And he wrote some fascinating books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. And in those books, he lays out four categories of evidence for the historicity of the resurrection. And they all start with the letter E. I want to give them to you uh, on this Easter weekend. And the first one is this word, execution. Because before you can have a resurrection, somebody's got to really actually be dead. And the testimony of history is that Jesus' body was dead before he was taken down off the cross. In fact, there is never, there's not a single example of anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. And to verify that he was dead, the Roman soldiers thrust a spear through his ribcage, through his heart, and then he would have been taken down from the cross and verified, been verified dead by the medical experts of the time. In fact, the American Medical Association published a peer-reviewed article in their journal, and this is what they said about the evidence of the crucifixion. Clearly, the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. So Jesus was dead when they took him down off the cross. Second category of evidence is the word early. The documented story of Jesus' death and resurrection was according to historical standards, unbelievably early in the movement. Uh, they, um, historians say that in order for an urban legend or a myth to actually grow, certainly to the size where it would replace core historical truth, it takes more than two full generations. Yet scholars can trace the earliest creeds of Christianity, which were centered around the resurrection of Jesus, all the way back to within months of his death. And the whole testimony was written and documented and circulated within the same generation in the Roman Empire that Jesus was crucified, which by historical standards is like a, it's like a breaking news flash. So it was incredibly early. Third category of evidence is the word empty. That's the empty tomb. Jesus' body was buried in, the, in a tomb that belonged to a well-known benefactor named Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was well-known in the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus' body was buried, the grave was sealed, it was guarded, and then found ultimately empty on Easter Sunday morning. But the fascinating thing is that Joseph was well known in Jerusalem. The site of his tomb was well known in Jerusalem by Christians and non-Christians alike. And so all the opponents of Jesus had to do, and there were many of them, was simply one person go to the tomb of Jesus and produce the body, and they would have shut the whole thing down in its tracks, but nobody could do that because there was no body in the tomb. The question of history is not, was the tomb empty? The question of history is how did it get empty? The Roman authorities wouldn't have stolen Jesus' body. They wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish authorities wouldn't have stolen Jesus' body. Resurrection verified the claims they killed him over. The disciples did not have the means or the opportunity to steal Jesus' body. And so the question of history is how did the tomb get empty? And that is uh, what points to the fourth category of evidence and that is the eyewitnesses. Jesus appeared over the course of 40 days in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people. He appeared to skeptics and believers. He appeared outdoors and indoors. He appeared to large groups and individuals. He appeared during the daytime and at nighttime. He ate with people. He was seen by people. He was touched by people. And this is one of the misunderstandings even today. You know, people will say sometimes skeptics, well, the only reason we know about the resurrection is because the Bible says so. But we don't know about the resurrection because of what the Bible says. The Bible in its current form was not assembled until about 350 years after the death of Jesus. We know about the resurrection because Matthew, who was there, wrote it down and told us what happened. We know about the resurrection because Mark, who traveled with Peter and was his assistant for years, heard the stories over and over and carefully documented them so that we would know what what happened. 
We know about the resurrection because Luke, who was a researcher and a doctor, was hired to travel around the Roman Empire interviewing eyewitnesses so that he could document and write down what happened. We know about the resurrection because Peter, who was there, wrote two letters and he told us about it. We know about the resurrection because James, the brother of Jesus, was so convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead He began to worship Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. He became a leader in the early church. He ultimately was martyred for his faith in Jesus. And come on, any of you who have a brother know it takes more than a sermon and a few nice miracles for your brother to believe you are the Savior of the world. If your brother believes you are the Savior of the world, you are the Savior of the world. You're not tricking your brother. And so the eyewitnesses are there. There's so much evidence. I'm just skimming the surface. I hope, by the way, that if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, this strengthens your faith. It builds your faith. We don't have faith in faith. (laughs) We have faith because the world was changed by an event that happened in history that changed the world forever. Now, if you're here and you're a skeptic or an unbeliever, maybe uh, you uh, used to be a believer, but you've deconstructed your faith. My hope is that maybe this would pique your curiosity, inspire you to do some homework and to launch your own investigation. Now, here's the, here's the crazy thing, and I know this because I, I know there are a lot of people, uh, maybe some of you, who actually would never take the time to do that and to verify whether or not Jesus really rose from the dead simply because you find it uninteresting. Believe it or not, I, I meet people who would be honest, you know, say, hey, Brad, like, I don't want to offend you, but, man, this is interesting and all this thought-provoking. It's Easter. I'm here. But, you know, even if Jesus did rise from the dead, that was 2,000 years ago. He's not here now. I'm just trying to go to work. I'm just trying to take care of my kids. What does it even matter? For you, the question is not, did Jesus rise from the dead? It's, so what if Jesus did rise from the dead? And so I want to just spend the last few minutes of this message answering that question. So what if he did? Why should I even take my limited valuable time to verify whether or not this is true? Because I believe there are three, and they might be the three most fundamental problems we have in life that are ultimately solved only by the resurrection of Jesus. And so we looked at four E's. I want to give you three D's as we wrap this up. And the first problem is this. It's the question of deity. In other words, it's the question, what are you going to do with Jesus? There was a man named Charles Templeton, and you may not know his name. Most people have never heard the name Charles Templeton. But when he was a young preacher for an organization called Youth for Christ, it was actually written about him that he was the most uh, talented and promising young preacher in America, which is something because his associate at the time was a man named Billy Graham. The reason you probably never heard Charles Templeton's name is because five years after that was written about him, he left Christianity. He left for the faith. Well, 50 years later, Lee Strobel, when he was writing his book, The Case for Faith, tracked down Charles Templeton and interviewed him. uh, And He asked him some questions. He was in his 80s. He was still very sharp. And then he asked him this question. He said, what do you think about Jesus Christ now? This is 50 years later. And Charles Templeton said, I believe Jesus is the most important person who's ever lived. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned it from Jesus Christ. And then something unexpected happened. His voice started to crack, and his tears welled up in his eyes. He said, I miss him. There's one thing you can't debate, in my opinion, and that is that Jesus is the most compelling and captivating personality in history. Brilliant men from H.G. Wells to Albert Einstein to Dostoevsky have all agreed and admitted that no one has impacted history more than Jesus. But here's the problem. If You look back and say, well, Jesus was an inspiring historical figure, a good example for us to follow. If he did not rise from the dead, he was none of those things. He was a crazy man with a Messiah complex because Jesus claimed over and over, directly and indirectly, to be God. And so 
Here's what he said long before the crucifixion ever happened. Mark chapter 8. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. That's what Jesus said over and over during his life. And so Jesus, who claimed to be God, here's what the resurrection proves it verifies the life and the claims of Jesus and it says to us that Jesus is not a dead teacher to be admired he is a risen savior to be worshiped and followed he's someone you can and should surrender your heart to what are you going to do with Jesus that's the first problem second problem is the finality of death and this is a big one and here's the fascinating thing to me if, even if you don't believe in the resurrection, or even if you don't care about the resurrection, all of us live every day of our lives as if Jesus has, in fact, ra- been raised from the dead. <laughs> Here's what I mean. All of us live every day of our lives as if our lives have meaning. We maintain our health as if our lives matter. We take on student debt. We go to work. We try to make a contribution to the world as if our contribution to the world and our lives matter and have meaning. And listen, if all life is is just a few decades here on this earth and there's nothing after that, none of that stuff should matter. We shouldn't care about any of it. But what is the reason that death feels so unnatural? Why is it that death feels like an interruption? Why is it so frustrating that death feels so final? It's because you and I were created in the image of God as eternal beings. And that is the good news of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus proves that this life on this earth is not the end. When Jesus died and he rose from the grave, he proved that there is life after death. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to over 500 people showing them what life can look like even after you've died. People ate with him. People talked with him. There was relationship. He had a glorified body. And then Jesus proved through his resurrection that death does not have the final word. And he promises you and I that if our faith is in him, there is a hope beyond this life. And he promised to go there ahead of us and prepare a place for us. A place where we'll be reunited with the people that we love. A place that will redeem the sorrows of this life and multiply the joys of this life. A place from which we can look back and see in 3D living color that our lives on this earth actually did matter. And so now, when you and I experience the frustrations and the disillusionment and the unmet expectations and the unfulfilled longings of living in this broken world, you can know that you were made for more than this world and that there is hope beyond the grave secured for you through Jesus. He's alive. And one more problem, and this might be the biggest problem of all, is the problem of just the dysfunction in our world. The dysfunction in our hearts. I think anybody, if they're honest, has to acknowledge that there is something fundamentally broken in our world. Despite all of our technology, Despite all of the psychology, all of the medicine, we're living in the most technologically advanced era that society has ever known. Yet we still have all of the same problems that everyone has always had. War, famine, inequality of resources, poverty, disease, division. Why? Because the dysfunction in our world is a reflection of the dysfunction in our hearts. Our core problem is not a poor work ethic, it's not inefficient discipline, it's not, a, it's not low self-esteem. And our, our core problem is sin. It's this poison that runs through our veins that drives us to try to create alternative identities apart from God. And we think, man, I can change myself, I can save myself, if I can only go deeper within myself and truly find myself. But what if the real problem with yourself 
is that there is a programming virus in your heart. And the deeper we go within ourselves, the more trouble we're just going to find. And so the problem of dealing with all of that really comes down to the problem of dealing with sin. And here's what scripture says, 1 Corinthians 15, that if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you're still guilty of your sins. But because Jesus has been raised from the dead, your faith is powerful and you can be forgiven of your sins. That's the good news of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that on Good Friday, Jesus carried onto the cross and then buried in the grave all of your sin, all of my sin. On Friday, Jesus paid it all and now you can be justified through faith before God. And then on Sunday morning, when he rose victorious, when he rose triumphant from the grave, His resurrection was the receipt that proves your salvation has been fully bought and paid for. He's alive. And so today, you say, well, what's the evidence, Brad? I can show you 2,000 years of collective evidence of the lives Jesus has changed. The dysfunction that he has turned around. Peter's a great example. Man, when Jesus died, this was not the dude you'd build an organization on. Full of pride, fear, insecurity, jealousy. And he experienced the resurrected Jesus and it changed that coward into a courageous leader. Bold, humble, teachable. A roaring lion for God. For 30 years, Peter traveled all over the Roman Empire. The believers brought him into their homes. And they said, tell us again, tell us again. And he wrote it down. And he says to us, even today, 2,000 years later, if you're full of fear, if you're full of doubt, if you're struggling to believe all of this, so was I. I was in the back of the crowd when he died. After he died, I stopped believing. I went back to fishing. But I met him, and he was alive. And he changed me to the core. And so now Peter would say to you, he says to me, I am the evidence. My life is the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. And one of the great privileges I have as a pastor is I get a front row seat to see Jesus changing people's lives. And I see the evidence every day. I see the evidence every week when I look out and I think about the stories that are represented in this room. I see the evidence of the resurrection. When I see a friend who was addicted to Percocet for 28 years and carried a pill bottle around on his keychain because he couldn't go more than a few hours without a pill, who just celebrated three years clean without a single (laughs) pill because of Jesus, that's the evidence. When I sit with people who have decided to forgive Parents who abused them, spouses who abandoned them, leaders who mistreated them, and the freedom and the emotional health that comes racing into their hearts and minds as a result. They are the evidence. There is no body in the grave. The body of Jesus has been unleashed all over the world. The body of Christ is alive right here in Philly. It's in this room right now. The evidence that the body of Jesus has been raised is you, it's me. The evidence is every ex con turned evangelist, it's every single mom turned spirit-filled mom it's every addict turned mentor that is the evidence Jesus has been changing lives for 2,000 years he's still changing lives today and it is the most impressive collection of evidence the world has ever seen it's a powerful story I just want to ask you this Easter weekend What's the change that you need Jesus to make in your life? Hear a story like a lean story, and I'm just reminded that the power of Jesus can change a person to the core of their personality. There's no hard heart he can't soften. No past he can't wipe clean. And I want to ask you for a moment to settle into a moment of opportunity, a moment of decision. In fact, just would ask for the next few minutes, nobody moving around. I really believe these next few moments could be powerful and transformational for so many people. If you're watching online, 
here in the room. In fact, would you just close your eyes with me? And I want to just ask you a question that I believe all of us are going to hear one day from God himself. And that is this question, what are you going to do with Jesus? God isn't going to ask you how active you were for social justice causes. He's not going to ask you about your good deeds, about the money that you gave away, your career accomplishments. It's going to be one question. What did you do with my son, Jesus? And this is an opportunity. If you're an unbeliever, if you are skeptic, if you perhaps grew up around church but you've deconstructed your faith I believe for some of you it's going to be a moment of saying man I need to I need to reconstruct it I need to put it back together again maybe like Charles Templeton you're thinking about Jesus and hearing just again his name today thinking I miss him I miss him he's saying to so many right now I really believe it come home to some of you it's come back home so in a moment I'm going to pray a prayer and if today your desire is to say, Brad I, I want you to pray for me I want to be a part of that because I'm ready today to put my faith in Jesus I need him, I believe and even though there are probably some questions and doubts that are still in the nooks and the crannies of your mind and your heart listen there's time, you can get to that stuff but if you can believe in Jesus and what he's done that's enough that's enough if that's where you are today in a moment I'm just going to invite you to lift up your hand that's it I'm not going to make you stand or come forward we're not going to embarrass you in in, in any way but there is something powerful about taking just a small physical step of faith to say I'm in I'm coming back home I'm putting my faith in Jesus and so right now wherever you are here in person if you're watching online This is a moment of opportunity, a moment of decision. I don't want you to miss it. Jesus is calling your name. Come on, put your hand in the air right now if that's you. If you want to be a part of this invitation today, put your hand up in the air. Put it up. Just hold it up for a moment. Hold it up for a moment. Just keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So many hands. Thank you, God, for every single one. I know some of you, I can't see you. You're watching online, but God sees you right now. He is so near Come on, I want us to pray a prayer together. And every person who's lifted a hand, I want you to pray this out loud. And we're all going to pray with you now because we're one, about to be one big family. So come on, let's pray this to the Lord. Pray it out loud. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. And I believe that you died in my place. And I believe that you rose from the dead. And I'm ready to add my life to the pile of evidence so fill me with your power to live the life you've created me to live in Jesus name amen amen come on let's praise him today he's alive he's alive come on you can do better than that he's changing lives he's changing lives he's changing lives